From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to turn you to turn with me to a very familiar passage of Scripture to all of you. And uh, that is uh, found in Romans, the first chapter, and the 17th verse. And then I want us to turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter, where in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is explaining what he meant in the 17th verse of the first chapter. And this was the verse that shook all of Europe a little over 500 years ago when it was discovered and it was revealed to him in a powerful way to Martin Luther. First chapter of Romans, the 17th verse. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Not by our own goodness, not by our own works, but by faith. By grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then we turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter. What a marvelous chapter this fifth chapter is, and the sixth chapter. And the sixth chapter has something I want to speak on, and I've never before preached a sermon on this text. Be, beginning with verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I want to speak tonight on sowing and reaping. I noticed as we came in the lush farmland that's here in this Red River Valley. I guess there's nothing quite like it in the United States. I used to come to Fargo quite often, stop here at Fargo, Moorhead. You couldn't get to Winnipeg without stopping on Northwest Airlines here on a DC-3. Back in the 40s, we used to go back and forth to Winnipeg a lot, and we stopped here a lot. And I would see this country and often marvel at its lushness and congratulate you and your grandparents and parents that came here and settled here because this has become one of the great areas of the entire United States. I was born and reared on a farm, and I've read about families that have been losing their family farms, and I was reared on a family farm. And I remember the days back in the 20s and the 30s, back during the Depression when my father would look for rain and we would pray for rain, and we raised wheat and barley and grain. We didn't have sugar beets, but we did raise other things that would be familiar to you. Then my father had a, what he called a truck farm where he raised vegetables. And then we had dairy cattle and we milked. And every morning from the time I was about seven or eight, I had to get up at three o'clock and go milk cows. And when I was in high school, I milked 20 cows every morning before I went to school and milked those same 20 when I came home from school. And so I knew a little bit about farm work. Now, I believe that they're in the Bible there are five laws in sowing and reaping. First, you must sow to reap. In China, 2,000 years old seed were taken from an ancient tomb, and they're sprouting today and growing tomatoes, even though they were sown 2,000 years ago. But it wasn't until they were sown that they could produce a crop for reaping. We have to sow to reap. Now in Hosea, it says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Think of it, sow in goodness, sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. If you sow in righteousness, living a good life, putting your faith and your confidence in Christ, you are going to reap the mercy of God and the grace of God and salvation. For it is time, the scripture says, to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Has righteousness reigned upon you? Because unless you are clothed in the cloth of the righteousness of God, you'll never enter heaven. And that suit of clothes or that dress of righteousness was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. We have a cross on our, all of our churches, whatever our denomination may be. We agree on one thing, that the cross is the central fact of Christianity. 
And it's on the cross that Christ hung for our sins and died for us and provided for us a righteousness that you cannot provide for yourself. In Psalm 126, 5, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross in tears, as it were, so that we might have the joy of salvation. Now, if you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a scientist or a professor, you have to spend years of study. You, sto you sow study and you reap professionally. There was a hillbilly from the South who felt lost at Times Square, New York. So he asked a young fellow with a long beard, how, is the, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And snapping his fingers, the bearded man replied, practice man, practice. <laughs> and to be a great musician like Pavarotti, you have to practice passionately and perpetually. You reap excellence if you sow effort, but you have to sow in order to reap. Have you been sowing in good deeds? Have you been sowing in repentance? Have you been sowing in faith? Have you been sowing in Bible reading and prayer and church going faithfully? Have you been sowing so you can reap the grace and the mercy of God? Or have you been sowing the wild oats that so many people sow? Or been sowing things for your own lust and your own pleasures? And you're going to reap someday that which you have sowed. And then the second thing, if you sow, you will reap. Every person is a sower and a reaper. Now, the Bible teaches that Satan is a deceiver. And in Galatians 6, it says, be not deceived. Many of you are already deceived. He that soweth to his flesh, that is, lust, drugs, wrong kinds of sex, too much drink, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6, it says, A wicked man soweth discord, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. The Bible warns that if we continue that kind of life, we will be broken. We'll, we're going to reap what we sow. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in his The Reaper and the Flowers says, Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. You remember Cain became jealous of his brother Abel, and he killed his brother in a fit of jealousy and rage and became the first murderer, and that was the first war, and that took place in paradise. Many people say, oh, if we only change society, if we make the world better, if we spend more money, if everybody had everything they wanted, it would, they would, we would produce a new man. This is what uh, Marx taught. This is what Lenin strongly believed. He had great ideals. He believed that they would ultimately produce a new man. But we've lived long enough now to know that it has not produced a new man. The only person that can produce a new man is the one that said, you must be born again. It doesn't mean really born again. It means born from above, born by the Spirit of God. Just as you were born into the physical world and from your mother's womb, you must be born into the spiritual world. And so in one sense, it's being born the second time. The third thing is you will reap what you sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Numbers 32, it says, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin, and we're all sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and sin means the breaking of God's law, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if you break those commandments in one place, you're guilty of all. And we're all sinners, and we've broken all the commandments. We all need the mercy and the grace and the love of God. Be sure. Your sin will find you out. Every sin that has ever been committed is going to be found out either in this life or at the judgment. Somewhere, sometime, every little sin that you've committed and every big sin will find you out. Because you remember the tapes 
back in Watergate days and what they did to a president? God has tapes far more sophisticated. Not only does he record all of our actions, but all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our intents are recorded. And you may deny it at the judgment and say, God, it just didn't happen that way. He's got it all there. He has every moral choice you faced and he has the road that you took. You'll reap what you sow. In Job 4, it says, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You're going to reap. Everything that you sow, you'll reap. I read in Time Magazine review of a book entitled Wild Oats, and some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday morning and pray for a crop failure. It's not going to be that way. The crop is going to come in. And how many of us go to church and we really don't know Christ? I did. I was reared a Presbyterian. And I was baptized. I was confirmed in the church. And I thought everything was all right. I thought the minister was a little bit boring. I didn't particularly like going to church, but I went because my parents told me to go. And if you knew my father, you know you'd go if he told you. But I really didn't have Christ in my heart. I didn't have assurance. I didn't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I wasn't sure of that. I wasn't certain that my sins had been forgiven. So one day when they had an evangelistic meeting, I went forward and received Christ into my heart and recommitted my life to Christ. And I remember the things that I promised those elders when I met with them at the time of confirmation. And I said, Lord, I'm going to recommit my life to you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm not sure where I stand, but I want to be sure. And that simple decision changed my entire life. But life doesn't always work that way. In Proverbs 28, it says, He that covered his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God is willing to have mercy upon you. He's willing to bestow his grace upon you. He's willing to forgive you if you willing to repent of your sin and receive him. You see, the Bible says that sin is no respect of persons. In James 1, it says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And that death is not only natural death when your body dies, but you can be dead right now where you're sitting, spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. That's the reason people can't find peace and joy and happiness today. They search for it. They want it, but they can't find it. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in an extramarital affair. You can't find it any other place. Oh, you can have a temporary time. You can get drunk and go out with some girl and have a good time for a while, but it soon wears off. It's gone. I had a bishop. We've had a number of bishops, but one bishop in particular who came forward in our meeting, an Anglican bishop in England. And later, I saw him privately. And I said, Bishop, why did you have to come forward? He said, you know, I've been to the university, I've gotten my degrees, and I've been to the theological school and all the rest. And he said, I'm, I'm now in my 50s and I'm a bishop. But he said, I am not sure where I stand before God. And I just wanted to make sure. Do you feel that way? You can make sure tonight before you leave here. And then the fourth thing, the ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Leviticus 19, 19 says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. The Bible teaches that when the good seed of the Word of God is sown, the devil comes along and sows tares. Jesus said, you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil and you'll reap hell. The devil for thousands of years has been issuing an invitation to hell to all of those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. Come to Christ now. Give him your life. On the cross, Jesus Christ conquered Satan and hell and sin. And in 1 John 3, 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil so that we might live the life after Christ. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ comes to live within you and gives you a new power to live a life that you never dreamed you could live. And he produces within you love and joy and peace and satisfaction and fulfillment that you never knew before. And he puts you on the right road because Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life everlasting. And then fifthly and lastly, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says, They have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. John 4, 36 says, He receiveth wages that reaps. Charles Reed wrote a century ago, Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Lord Macaulay, the great historian, once wrote, Old men reap. Someone was showing a clergyman through one of the prisons the other day in the east. And they saw an old man sitting there weeping. And they asked the warden, what is he doing? And the warden replied, he's reaping. And that's where many of us are going. We're going to a place where we're going to reap. We've been sowing all these weeks and months and years, and we think we're getting by with it. Our conscience no longer bothers us. Why? Because the Bible teaches that you can harden your conscience. You can cause it to become dead. It no longer speaks. It's no longer an accurate guide for you. Come to Christ and he'll resensitize your conscience. A hundred million people die every year. 270 million die every day. 10,000 people die every hour. 180 die every minute. Three die every second. And you will be one of those statistics one of these days. Are you ready to meet God? The Bible says prepare to meet God. Jesus said the dead shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two crowds. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do to make sure, to make certain? Many people want to be sure, but they don't know what to do. First, you must repent of sin. The word repent means to turn, to change, to change the direction of your life, to change your mind. You change your mind about God, you change your mind about yourself and your need of God, and you go home ready to change the way you treat your wife or your husband or your parents or your children or your neighbors or the people you work with. You're ready for a change. Second, you put your total confidence and your total faith in Christ alone. You're not depending on anything else for your future salvation except the cross and the resurrection of Christ. For by the grace of God are you saved. The word grace means unmerited favor, something I don't deserve. Billy Graham doesn't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to the judgment. I deserve hell. But I'm going to heaven by the grace of God by Christ who died on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, something happened that none of us really understands. God laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus became the great sin bearer. He died for us. Then he comes into our hearts and he gives us a power to do good works. And we go out with a burden for our neighbors, a burden for peace in the world, for a burden to help the hungry, to feed the poor, to help the poor. That's our responsibility as believers. But we don't have the power to do the things we ought to do or to live the life we ought to do. But Jesus Christ gives it to you. He rose again. And we reap eternal life, forgiveness, peace, joy, love, the power of the Holy Spirit comes within eternity in heaven. We sang the song a moment ago, Amazing Grace. Do you know the story of that song? It was written by a slaver, a man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton became the slave of a slave in West Africa. 
one day when he was coming back to England on the slave ship and treating the slaves miserable and terrible, they had a thunderstorm. And he fell on his face and he remembered some scriptures that his mother had taught him when he was a boy. And he received Christ into his heart and it changed his life. And he went back to England and became a great friend of those who were to someday lead the fight against slavery in Parliament and did more to help probably than any other person motivate the British people toward outlawing slavery. He himself became the minister of an Anglican church. He himself wrote many hymns. And that was one of the hymns he wrote, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. I don't deserve it. John Newton said, I don't deserve it. And when he was an old man and he could barely get up into the pulpit and he was in his middle 80s, he held on to the pulpit and he said, I don't know much. But he said, I do know this, that I'm a great sinner and I have a great Savior. And John Newton left his mark for God after being a terrible sinner. You can be forgiven of any sin, any failure. It may be hypocrisy, whatever it is, but tonight you'd like to make sure. I'm going to ask you to do something that I've asked Africans for the thousands to do, Asians for the thousands, Europeans for the thousands, Americans for the thousands, and I've seen them do it for the thousands. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat where you're sitting right now and come and stand in front on this beautiful turf and stand there for a moment or two quietly and say, you know, I want to be sure about this. I want to be sure my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want this supernatural peace and joy and fulfillment that Christ can give me. And I want to settle it. I would like to rededicate myself to my confirmation vows or to my ba what my baptism meant. Whatever the reason, whatever your need, I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand. And after you've all come and stood there, I'm going to have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Or you may be the only one from your area to come, but get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now at this holy moment. And everyone in an attitude of prayer, you get up and come. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. I don't know who you are, but you need Christ. You come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just come and stand here quietly, young and old, whatever, whoever you are. We're going to wait, Catholic or Protestant, Jewish, whatever. You come and stand here and say yes and make sure of your relationship to Christ. And you may be in the choir or you may just be somebody that wandered in, but God is speaking to you. You come. Just stand here in front behind those cameras that are around here or right in here. We're going to wait on you, quickly. Bring somebody with you. And as these many hundreds make their personal decision for Christ here in Fargo, North Dakota, you too, wherever you are, can make that decision. Call the number on your television screen right now. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again.
I want to say a word to you that have been watching on television. You've been watching from other parts of the country and other parts of other countries. And you see people coming here in Fargo, Moorhead City, Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead City, Minnesota, and other parts of this great Midwestern area, or Northern Plains area, whatever area we want to call it. And you see them coming to make their commitment. You can make your commitment where you are, in your hotel room, or in your bedroom, or in your living room, or with your family. Make your surrender to Christ now and say, Lord, I need you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Give me assurance of my own faith. I'm going to pray that you'll make that commitment now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. And when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him. Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back. And we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert, Elijah. And he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox 
one preacher than she was all the armies of England. One man and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel. And she worshipped Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing that in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex, violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence, put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest, except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire, we know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell, maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. And from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. And then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. 
Then Elijah called upon God. And the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group, one man, Elijah. So on the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And, on the, and out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God, they were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice, so what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God and the baby would be burned up and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to Baal in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success. I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said. And she's only 21 now. 21 years. thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said, it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness 
within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going? Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God made in God's image, made for fellowship with God. And you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something and you'll never find it. I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientists and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money and I know some of the richest men in America and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power. And they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said make a choice. He said there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race, and that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups, those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell. There is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever. And there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever. You must make a choice. You young people, you have to make the choice. This is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you. Your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them. You've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 
He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world, the price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different, but he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus, and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross, and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week, and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you're filled with some doubts and weakness. This is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ. We don't start, just jump right out and be full grown. Grady Wilson, just, his daughter just had twins. Well, they weren't born full grown. One of them was five pounds and one was six pounds, and they're just little tiny babies. But they will be full grown someday. But it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin, but you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long will you halt between two opinions? Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman and a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliot. She was suffering ill health. And he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. 
And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are, with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over the stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church. You might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here quietly, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. But you get up and come right now and make your commitment to Christ. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. you that are watching by television, you can make your commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. Hundreds of people here at the University of Kentucky Coliseum are coming to Jesus Christ. They're choosing between these two opinions. They're choosing Christ. They're coming just as they are. You can come just as you are where you are. May God help you to make that commitment tonight. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.